In this video, we're going to discuss evolution. We spend a large amount of time in class talking about evolution because really, all of the diversity that you see between different people, between all the trees outside, came from evolution. So first off, how do we define evolution? Evolution is a change in allele frequency over time. So if you still don't know what an allele is, you really got to make sure you know it. Okay, I'm going to repeat one more time. What is an allele? So when we wrote uh, for the Punnett square, the big A, little a, big A, big A, little a, little a, all of these things are called allele. And A could be, um, a big A could be uh, the brown hair allele for the hair color gene. All right, the little a could be the red hair allele for the hair color gene. So you got to make sure that you know these words very very accurately what is an allele what is a gene okay so the, the evolution is to change an allele frequency so uh what is an allele frequency let's say you have um 30 people in this room um we all got hair color genes but there are 10 little a alleles out of the entire classroom of 30 people for example um, you will do three divided by 60 because each people will have uh, two alleles of the same gene. So three divided by 60, that percentage is the allele frequency of the big A allele, okay? Um, well, we'll see an example of that a little bit later on as well. Um, if we change that frequency, let's say you start with 10% uh, big A allele and five years later it's changed to 2% of the big A allele in the population then that is a change in allele frequency and we call that evolution. What mechanism allow populations of a certain species to overpopulate? It's important that a population has overpopulation because the overpopulation um, of the population creates a lot of competition between the different organisms living in that area. And because there's that competition, there's the survival of the fittest that actually comes up. So, Reproduction is important because that actually provides the possibility for evolution. What generates variations in uh, population? There are a lot of them. First off, uh, the most important one is mutation. Mutation is what changes the DNA code. And when the DNA code changes, that provides the possibility of having different traits and different um, phenotypes, right? And if there's a difference in phenotype, let's say some male birds are prettier than some of the other male birds and then those prettier male birds can be selected uh, by the female and then over time you'll get more and more of those really pretty male birds so that provides the possibility for evolution um, what else can allow evolution to happen meiosis remember meiosis gives you four gametes that all look different so that also produce the variation that we need in the population for evolution um, there's reproduction. Fertilization is where you put two gametes together, sperm and egg. Now you got an individual with its own individual combinations of traits. Crossing over, you should know what this is. Um, genetic drift as well, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Does evolution happen because the species want a certain trait? No, that's not how it works. If you really want wings, you will not just grow wings. It has to happen over time. Uh, if it happens at all, because evolution, you know, is based on the environment. So there are two really important persons that you need to know about. The first one is Lamarck, and the other one is Darwin. For Lamarck, uh, he has some theories. He thought about use or disuse, meaning that, let's say you have the giraffe. If the giraffe is using his, his neck to get the leaves from higher trees, then... Uh, the neck will get longer, but if the giraffe is no longer eating from the taller trees, let's say the, the giraffe is now living in a, um, a place with a lot of bushes, and then the giraffe neck is going to shrink. We know that that's not how it works, but he tried to, you know, that was just, at, at the time, that's what people thought was working, because you can look, look around and see some evidence for that as well. The next was this inheritance of acquired trait. So it's saying that, let's say you, uh, as a person, build your muscles really well. Your son is going to be born with a lot of muscles. So acquired traits, so something that you get during your lifetime, um, inheritance of acquired traits. That's what Lamarck thought was true, but it's actually not true. 
Uh, Darwin went on a boat ride and he found out three things. Species vary globally, species vary locally, and species vary over time. There's change in the species that can happen, that you can see. All right, um, so here are some things that Darwin figured out, conditions that natural selections occur. And what does fit mean? So Darwin was the first one. In order for evolution to happen, there has to be the struggle for existence, like I said. If there's an unlimited amount of resources uh, with very little population, then everybody gets to live and reproduce. So then there's no such thing as fit. But because there is a limited amount of resource and uh, there are too many individuals within that area that are fighting for the resource, whether it's food or water or mates, um, those struggle allow certain individuals to be more fit. So now we come up with the next one, variation and adapt adaptations. Because there's the struggle for existence, and because there are individuals that are different from each other, those individuals that are more adapted to the environment, all right, those that are more fit can survive and reproduce. So for example, let's say we have a whole bunch of population, uh, a population of birds, and we have the male and female birds. Um, let's say in this population, there are 30 uh, birds in total, 20 males, 10 females. So not all those 20 males are going to be able to um, get a mate because in this bird population, one male and one female. That's how it works. Um, so now we have the struggle for existence because if those uh, don't have mates, um, they will not be able to pass on their, uh, their genes to the offspring. They will not be able to reproduce. And then there's variation and adaptation. The ones that are prettier, I say, got a, a pretty feather on the head of the male birds. So those that do have those uh, traits are going to be able to be selected. So now it comes the next one, survival of the fittest. Fit means you can survive and reproduce. So out of those 20 male birds, the 10 that are really pretty uh, get to survive and reproduce. And then... All right, now we're on to the last one. It's called descent with modification. What that means is that all species on Earth, whether it's living or extinct, they're all related to a common ancestor, one single ancient common ancestor. So everybody is evolutionary cousins. So for these things, um, basically for the most part, you just have to make sure that you have the right idea on how evolution works. But then there are also some vocabularies um, that we'll see later on that you need to remember. So here's one. Here's this uh, word called speciation. What does that mean? Species, 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 speciation. So speciation is the formation of new species. Let's say we have one bird population. There are some ugly ones. There are some prettier ones. Eventually, they divide, diverge into two different species. They can no longer inbreed. Um, then we call that speciation. And then what is the difference between natural selection and artificial selection? Natural selection is when the environment um, allowed the ones that are more fit to survive and reproduce and cause evolution, which is the change in allele frequency over time. Say it after me, change in allele frequency over time is evolution. All right, the next one is artificial selection. Artificial, you know it's something that human does. So artificial selection is when people selectively, selectively breed a certain trait. Um, I, I guess, for example, a uh, golden retriever. If you want to breed a golden retriever, you have to uh, select certain traits, right? You always select for the, for the gold color of the dogs, and then eventually all the golden retrievers are gold. Anyway, the next one are, um, what are some evidence for evolution? So we talk about evolution, but how do we know it's real? Uh, there are plenty more uh, evidence than what we're going to talk about, but, but here it is. The first one is called geographic distribution. What that means is that different animals within different areas on Earth um, kind of represent each other a little bit. So for example, um, there are marsupials. So marsupials are animals with pouches. There are marsupials in Australia, and they, they're mostly, most of our marsupials live in Australia, but there are also marsupials in North America. The marsupial in Australia it could be koala or kangaroo. Marsupial in America could be the opossums. 
But why is this telling you about evolution? Because all of these organisms have their pouches, not because they develop pouches on their own. It's because they shared a common ancestor at one point, and that common ancestor had pouches. That was before um, the North America region and Australia uh, land separated. So there were actually uh, marsupials at all, you know, different parts of the world. So now we also have marsupials at different parts of the world, and they're different species. The next one is fossils. When you look at fossils, you can see some similarities and differences between them. Um, so that's an evidence for evolution. Next one is called homologous chromosomes. You need to make sure that you know what this is. A homologous chromosome, you know, wait, no, not a homologous chromosome, oops. It's homologous structure. Um, homologous structure is similar to homologous chromosome. Homologous means same. But homologous structure is talking about a similarity in bone structure between different species and species that, are, that look like they're um, not very related to each other. So for example, for human, cat, whale, and bat, we all have these um, kind of finger bone structures, even though whales don't really have fingers and bats don't have fingers. But because we have those uh, similar stru bone structures, it tells us that you know, it's more likely that there was a common ancestor who had this similar bone structure that gave rise to all four of these species instead of the four species just so happened that they all developed these structures on their own. Like that's way less chance than the common ancestor theory. Um, so this is homologous structure. What are some examples? You already saw it. Uh, what is analogous structure? So if you know exactly what homologous structure is, similar structures that can tell you about common ancestry, then you would know that this is not homologous structure, so it's called analogous structure. What it is is that um, there are similar, there could be similar characteristics on the outside, but it doesn't actually tell you about common ancestry. So the example would be butterfly's wing and bat wings. They are both used to fly, but the butterfly wing doesn't really have bones. It has exoskeleton, which is like the, you know, the skeleton that uh, insects have, but obviously a butterfly is not an animal, so um, it developed wings because uh, of its own evolutionary path, and then the wing for bats also developed on its own. They did not have wings because they sh their common ancestor had wings, okay? So this one does not tell you about evolution. Um, and one more, uh, later we're going to see these two words called um, conversion evolution and diversion evolution. So this will be diversion evolution, where you start with one common ancestor, but then they diverge into different species. Conversion evolution is you start with different common ancestors, different ancestors, but then they kind of converge, they're coming together uh, and having similar traits. The next one is called vestigial structure. Those are structures, uh, bone structures that were there because the common ancestor had it, but uh, they're no longer functional. But they do tell you about common ancestry, right? Uh, whale have these uh, pelvis and femur bones, and that tells you that you know the whale, uh, the whale ancestor at one point had legs, but then they no longer have legs. They just have those tiny bones that are so left over from the common ancestor. Why are they still there? Because, because evolution, it just so happened that they're still there, but they're no longer functional. The next one is called embryonic development. So what that's talking about is that uh, during, um, during embryogenesis, when, when a fertilized egg is turning into a full um, organism, during that process, early on, uh, for all the animals, they their embryonic patterns kind of look the same. So if you look at, if you just Google embryonic development, you'll see that um, a snake embryo even kind of looks like a human embryo, but obviously we're not the same, but they're similar because we shared a common ancestor. The last one is molecular biology. biology. This one we use a lot nowadays with genetic testing and that kind of stuff. Um, so that is the similarity in genetic code where you actually look at the DNA um, you can also look at RNA and protein, but um, 
Despite, um, beside having similar DNA sequences, RNA sequences, and protein sequences in very closely related organisms, we also share the same genetic code. So everything that has DNA shares ATCG, whether you're a person or you're a bacteria. Everything, or even when you're a virus. And RNA, um, we have AGCU, that always happens. Proteins. Proteins... Um, Right, we have all those amino acids, and every single organism has those amino acids. So that tells you we didn't just came up with that somehow, uh, randomly. They came up because because of evolution, because our common ancestor, when it was just one single cell, had those DNA, RNA, protein bases. And the transcription translation mechanisms are relatively similar in different organisms as well. All right, the next one is. How is evolution defined in genetic terms? Allele frequency, change in allele frequency. Um, what is a gene pool? So here's a picture of a gene pool. Let's say we were looking at the color of the beetles, and it can either be represented as big A, big A, or big A, little A, or little A, little A. If we consider all every single one of the, the alleles, remember the allele is a letter. If we consider every single one of these letters, um, that's a gene pool. The next one is what is allele frequency? How do you calculate that? So if you count all of the A's, right, whether it's big A or little A, you count all of the A's. If you want to calculate the big A frequency, you will count all of the big A's, the individual big A's. So right here, that would be two big A's. You count all of the big A's divided by all of the A's. So big A plus little A, that would be the big A frequency. If you want to calculate the little A frequency, it's going to be all of the little a's divided by little a plus big A. Um, that's the frequency of the little a. So the next one is, uh, why is mutation important? You can just look through this. We, um, we already talked about it. So mutation gives you the possibility of evolution. Um, this one, why does sexual reproduction provide more opportunities for genetic variation than asexual reproduction? Because asexual... Um, generally, only give you the exact copies of the original uh, organism unless there is conjugation or mutation, which doesn't always happen. It happens quite often, but for sexual reproduction, you know that uh, there's going to be some kind of difference. So one thing that you can consider is that you and your brother and sister um, might all share the same parents but you never look the same, right? You might have similar noses, you might have similar hair colors uh, because you have the same parents, but at the same time, there are very many differences between you and your siblings, and that is because of the, um, the variations that sexual reproduction process provide. The next one is called lateral gene transfer. Lateral gene transfer... Um, is basically this process. We can have two bacteria. One could have a plasmid of some sort. Um, between bacteria that are nearby, they can build this little pillars. It's kind of like a bridge where they can send a copy of this DNA over to the next bacteria. So this bacteria, even though it didn't have this plasmid originally, it can have new characteristics. So that's how bacteria can, um, that's one way bacteria can be different. Um, bacteria can also have Mutation, because everything can have mutation that has a gene genome. The next one is, uh, oh, what is bacterial conjugation? This is also called conjugation. What type of organism does lateral gene transfer happen? Uh, that would be bacteria. The next one, what is the difference between single gene trait and polygenic traits? Single gene trait is when you're only talking about a trait that can be controlled by one gene. So let's say... Uh, let's say uh, color blindness. Color blindness um, is a single gene trait, so it's controlled by only one gene. Right? There are no other factors that can contribute to it. So for single gene trait, you can see a change in allele frequency very easily. So for example, over here, remember when we calculated the, the allele frequency, right? So you can take a look at these numbers and see if you can calculate those. Um, and you can see not only that there's a change in the frequency of the trait itself, there's also a change in the allele frequencies. So that's how single gene trait um, respond to evolution. However, with polygenic trait, um, because one trait can be controlled by multiple genes, you 
can no longer get like just white or black or gray, but you would have white a little bit grayer, a little more、uh, grayer, and then you you know you keep going. You have a variety of traits. So for example, over here,、uh, height in human is an example of polygenic trait. It's controlled by many genes and is also controlled by the environment. So the result is you would have a variety of、uh, the trait. You have people who are, you know, four feet five. I don't know if, if that's possible. And then you have people who are.、Um, I'm sure it is. And then you have people who are five feet. And then you have people who are five five. And then you have six feet. Whatever. But you you generally get this、uh, little bell curve of distribution of phenotype to frequency of the phenotype. And Um, so we talk about this one. What are the results of polygenic traits、um, after evolution happens? There are three possibilities. The first one is called directional selection. The second one is called stabilizing selection. Third one is called disruptive selection. So for directional selection, you, you start with this bell curve, right? You have this bell, regular bell curve. For example, if a giraffe with longer neck is more fit because they can reach. To taller leaves, and they have more resources, then those giraffe get to survive and reproduce. After many generations of giraffes, 50 years later, more of the giraffes will have longer necks because the longer necks are surviving and reproducing and passing on that long neck gene to the next generation as well. So the result is this bell curve is going to shift toward one side, but in this case, it's shifting toward the longer side. Okay. Um, the shift is going in a certain direction. That's why it's called directional selection. The next one is called stabilizing selection. In this case, the medium, the median、uh, trait, the mean trait is better. It's more fit in that environment than the this extreme and this extreme over here. So, for example, for human babies, the babies who are born too small or too big. Generally, have lower fitness. So, if they're too small, they don't have enough nutrition. They're not developed enough that they might die. And then the the really big babies might create some complications during birth. So they are not very fit either. So the babies who have an average, more toward the average、uh, um, weight, are more fit. So the result is your curve is going to more look like this, where it come, becomes thinner because those babies died, those babies died, and those baby lived. Last one is called disruptive selection. This one is for the mean、um, trait is less fit than the two extremes. An example would be the peppered moss in London. What happened was in rural area where there was not as much pollution, the lighter color, the white moss, were able to live and reproduce. And in industrialized area where the trees were darker, the dark moss. Were able to survive and reproduce, but anything in between is not able to survive and reproduce in the rural area or the industrialized area. So the result is you get a curve like this in the end. The next one is called genetic drift. Genetic drift is a chance event that happens, and just something happened, and the allele frequency changes. It's not due to natural selection; it just stuff happened. Okay, there are two examples that you need to know. Um, so, so you need to know that it's a chance event. A chance event just it happened.、Uh, there are two examples: bottleneck effect and founder effect. For bottleneck effect, you can look at this picture where you have a big population. Let's say you have 50 goats on a mountain. There are 25 white goats, 25、uh, black goats, and that's、uh, 50% and 50%. However, there's a natural disaster.、Uh, I don't know. A, a lightning struck a tree and burned a bunch of goats. And now you only have 20 goats left in the population. It just so happened that two of the white goats lived, and、uh, 18 of the black goats lived. And now the percent of black goat to white goat is very different from the original 50/50. But is that is that anything that we can do about? It just it's just something that happened. There were just some very unlucky goat. So that is called a bottleneck effect, where the Population is greatly reduced due to some critical event. 
The next one is called a founder effect, where you have an original population. Let's say, we're still talking about the goats. On um, this one mountain, there's 50-50, 50% 50%, um, white, 50% black goat. There's a mountain nearby, and it just so happened that uh, 20 of the white goats migrated to the mountain nearby, and then two of the black goats mi migrated to the mountain nearby. Now the result is, uh, at this new mountain, there's going to be more percentage of the white goats. It's just something that happened, but this is a migration uh, thing. This is a small population. Well, it's a small population, a part of the population go to a new area. And this new area, um, allele frequency of the population is very different, potentially, from the original population. It just happened. Next one, Hardy-Weinberg principle has five things that you need to know. If all of these five things happens, the allele frequency is not going to change. If any of these rules is violated, then the allele frequency will change, and we call that evolution. So when there is a mutation, when there's no mutation, the allele frequency stays the same. When there is mutation, you're violating this rule, then the allele frequency is going to change, and evolution happens. Second, uh, second one, random mating. That means uh, you have different individuals in the population and they mate randomly. There's no bird selecting a certain bird because this other bird is prettier kind of thing. So if you're doing random mating, the allele frequency will stay the same. If you're not doing random mating, you're doing sexual selection, you're only selecting certain mates for because of their trait that they have, such as we do in humans, then that is not random mating, so the allele frequency will change and evolution will happen. No gene flow. Gene flow is between different populations, there are individuals that can come in and come out. So that's um, migration, so that's immigration, emigration. If immigration, emigration happens, if it happens, the allele frequency is going to change. If it doesn't happen, it will stay the same. Infinite population size. If your population size is really big, um, let's say there's a million people, then these critical events, uh, this unfortunate or migration event, is not going to change the allele frequency as much. But if you only have a very small population, 100 people in a town, uh, 20 other people, 20 Europeans came to this little, I don't know, town in China, whatever, then the population um, frequency, uh, the allele frequency is going to change very drastically. This last one is no selection. There's no natural selection or no na artificial selection. Um, if there's no selection of any kind, then there's not going to be an allele frequency change. But if there is a selection, then the allele frequency will stay the same. There are three types of isolation that can lead to new species. How do we form new species? It's a very important thing. How do we form new species? The first one is called reproductive isolation. Where, um, so that, that is fundamentally for biology. We consider having a reproductive isolation tells us that they are um, they're different species. That's only one way that we can tell that they're, that they're different species. So for example, let's say dog and cat. They cannot produce a dog-cat mixture because it just doesn't work. So reproductive isolation is talking about how different species cannot interbreed. They cannot interbreed, okay? Um, and uh, due to... A variety of reasons. So here are some reasons. The first one is maybe uh, they've been apart for so long that there's a behavioral isolation right here. Behavioral isolation talks about a behavioral difference that prevent them from mating. So for example, we have this bird and this bird and they don't like each other's sons. That's a perfectly good reason for them to not mate. The next one is what is a uh, the geographical isolation can also cause reproductive isolation. So we have these two foxes, but they've been apart it from uh, by this river for so long that they become very different and they can no longer mate. The last one is um, temporal isolation where their mating time in the year or the day is different. So some flowers might be uh, blooming in April and there are other types of flowers that are blooming in August and those two types of flowers will never uh, produce offspring because they're, they're not existing at the same time. They're not mating at the same time. The next one is called binomial nomenclature. A binomial nomenclature is a two-part name that uh, you, you assign for a certain species. This name is universally accepted. Um, 
So how it works is that the first part tells you what the genus is, the second part tells you what the species is. So for example, Homo sapien, we belong to the genus Homo, and then we're sapiens, the species. The modern classification system, um, they're the six, seven taxa, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Remember, I didn't ask you to remember all of these. I might still give you a picture and ask you what is the phylum that blah, blah, blah species are belong to. So you should be able to name that. Or which species are belongs to the same phylum, that kind of thing. But I'll give you a chart if I ask you this question at all. The next one is uh, the three domains of life. This you do need to know. You have to know this. The three domains of life are bacteria, archaea, I like to switch this, and eukarya. Bacteria and archaea are both archaea. Bacteria and archaea are both um, prokaryotes, and eukarya are eukaryotes. So bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes because they don't have a uh, with no, they don't have a nucleus or internal membrane. So they don't have a nucleus and they don't have membrane bound organelles. So uh, mitochondria, for example, mitochondria, this organelle has membranes. Bacteria do not have organelles like that. And also archaea though, uh, either. Uh, archaea, what's special about them is that they don't have nucleus, and, but they can live in very extreme environments. That's all you have to know. Eukarya are organisms that has a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. And the next one, you need to know the sixth um, kingdom system. There's eubacteria, which is, the kingdom is bacteria, but the phylum, oh no, the kingdom is bacteria, but they uh, also belongs to the domain of bacteria. So domain goes above kingdom. But we call this the seven taxa system because the domain didn't exist yet when the taxa system was uh, formed. So eubacteria belongs to the domain bacteria. Archaea bacteria, the kingdom, belongs to the domain archaea. And then all these four belongs to the kingdom eukarya, protists, fungi, plant, and animals. The next one is uh, still three domains of life. Um, no bacteria, not all bacteria need oxygen. Some of them do, but some of them don't. Some of them have cell membranes, some of them don't. But you know this one already. Um, you need to know autotrophs and heterotrophs. Autotrophs are ones that can make their own food. Heterotrophs are ones that have to consume other things, so animals, for example. Fungi, um, examples, yeast, mold, mushrooms, plants are autotrophs. They have cell walls. Animals are multicellular, um, obviously. So for this chart, you don't really know, you don't really need to know the entire thing, but you definitely need to know that bacteria and archaea are, are both unicellular. Eukarya can be unicellular or multicellular, but you know animals and plants have to be multicellular. And then you know what prokaryotes and eukaryotes are. Um, for this part, there's not much to talk about. You just need to know how to read a cladogram. Uh, if you don't know how to read a cladogram, you have to see me, okay? If you ever gotten this wrong and you're still confused on how to see uh, how to read a cladogram, please see me because this is going to be on the test. It, this has to be because it's really important. So what is a cladogram? Um, these things are cladograms. What you need to know is that whenever you see a cladogram, you have to be able to draw a timeline. A timeline can be drawn from the root of a cladogram to the tips of the cladogram. So the root is just when you have one branch, the tip is the, you know, all those branches. If you draw a timeline, you go from here to here this way. This is the ancient time, this is now. This is the, the most recent time. So draw a timeline like that. And then for a clade, uh, whatever, we already talked about that. So here's clade and not clade. Um, make sure you know this, we just talked about this, okay? And then the next one is, um, how do you tell when uh, different species have a common ancestor? So B and C have a common ancestor right here. A, B, and C share a common ancestor right here. So you just look at the branches and see where it, um, you know, has a, it come together. And then uh, whenever you see a common ancestor, that's also where the speciation event happens. So for example, right here, we have the common ancestor for B and C. 
but this is also where B and C start diverging into different species. Okay. Um, you can also know uh, if two species share a most recent common ancestor, if we draw a timeline, this is more recent than this. This is the most recent common ancestor, so B and C are most closely related. They're more closely related than A to B or A to C. The next one is so you can look at these questions. Um, you can look at this one and see what information you can get out of this. For example, mouse and chimp both have fur mammary gland because this happened before mouse and chimp um, or individual species. A feather only become, uh, belongs to pigeons. The claws or nails belong to lizard, pigeon, mouse, and chimp. So just make sure that you know how to read it. Um, for this chart, you're, you can see that if the timeline goes all the way to here and the the line for the organism for the species actually goes all the way to here. That means they're still alive. But if it stops halfway in the middle, that means they're uh, they're dead. The next one, well, they, they went extinct. That's what I meant. What is the difference between relative dating and radiometric dating? Relative dating is you're looking at the fossils and you can tell relatively by um, looking at the fossil layers, relatively what um, time of in the history it existed or it became fossilized. Um, radiometric dating is when you look at when you look at what we call these radioactive elements and you can see how they decay in order to tell um, exactly how long that fossil has been fossilized. This next one is uh, what is diversion evolution? That's when you have one common ancestor, it diverged into two different species. That's, that's it, diversion evolution. You get new species from diverging from the same common ancestor. What is coevolution? Coevolution example is right here. Uh, co is co op, it's happening together. Coevolution, a typical example is flower and pollinators. So as a flower is uh, changing, like this, the pollinator also changes with it. It's just something that happens side by side. What is adaptive radiation? Adaptive radiation is where you start with one species and then it adapted and radiated into many different species within that area. So that's adaptive radiation. Okay. Theory of endosymbiosis, we can't talk about this enough. Um, examples are mitochondria and chloroplasts. Let's look at this. We had a prokaryote and we had a eukaryote. The eukaryote kind of ate, quote unquote. The prokaryote, eventually the prokaryote became a part of the eukaryotic organelle and then it stayed there forever. Um, does evolution happen the same rate for all organisms? No, because things don't just happen the same way ever. And then um, does it usually take a short time or a long time? Usually a long time. Which one of these is the actual one? Gradualism or punctuated equilibrium? This is gradualism, where if you draw a timeline, this is old, this is new, ancient, now. Um, gradualism model says evolution happens gradually. Things change slowly and gradually like this. But punctuated equilibrium says an organism stays the same for a long time, and then it changes very quickly, stays the same for a long time. That is what, how evolution actually happens. Spontaneous generation is the theory that things can appear out of nowhere, which we know is not true. So here's an example um, of spontaneous generation. So we just, you know, things don't actually spontaneous gen generate. All right, that's it. It's a little bit long, um, but I'll make a vocabulary sheet and put it online so you can look at that and use it as a study tool for yourself. Bye.